Welcome everybody to the third in our tree health webinar series, Why Are My Trees Dying? I'm Glenn Ahrens. I'm the OSU Extension Forester in Clackamas, Marion, Hood River Counties. And uh, my coworker, Sarah Cameron, uh, helped to organize this, this series. And we're just going to be the hosts, co-hosts. And uh, welcome tonight, Dave Shaw, our speaker on the topic of Douglas fir. And I'll just a little bit of housekeeping. I think everyone's pretty familiar with Zoom, but uh, this is a Zoom meeting and we're going to have you all muted when you're not talking and for the most part, uh, keep you muted. And as we go, if you think of questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, when Dave is talking, he may stop to address any particularly interesting questions and then at the end we'll have a, a good period of time for Q&A as well um, and so definitely good to put your questions in chat as they occur to you so you don't have to hold them in your mind um, and then Sarah and I will be kind of minding that as Dave works on the presentation so with that we'll go ahead and get started uh, welcome Dave Shaw our forest health specialist for OSU Extension Forestry and Natural Resources and Dave has been one version of a forest health specialist. Uh, he's trained in entomology, forest entomology and pathology, and uh, been our forest health extension specialist for almost 20 years at Oregon State University, and before that uh, with the University of Washington. So Dave definitely is very knowledgeable, and as you might expect, he gets a lot of the questions and knows a fair number of answers. Um, so we're looking forward to your talk, Dave. And with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Dave, uh, to get started on Douglas Fir. This is the third of the series, and then the fourth is next week, um, which will be me talking about alder and broadleaf trees in this series. But I'll turn it over to you now, Dave. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm always excited to talk about Douglas Fir. Uh, of course, it is the um, premier tree of Oregon. Uh, especially on the west side. But uh, so um, today uh, we're talking about, you know, basically why are my trees dying or what's going on with Douglas fir and several other species. But today we'll focus on Douglas fir. Um, if uh, some of these um, uh, photos may, you may recognize this. This is a classic photo from in the valley margin with dead Douglas fir uh, mixed in with uh, Oregon white oak, uh, a really sort of a classic phenomena that we've been seeing. Um, and, uh, you know, here again, if you're hiking in the forest or in the forest around the valley margin of the Willamette Valley, this is another classic scenario where you'll see groups of uh, trees killed within a forest setting. Um, a lot of times uh, these trees will have this uh, fungus on them. This is the picture on the left there is the veiled polypore, uh, Cryptoporus volvatus. This is a fungus which um, emerges, it's vectored by insects and um, it, uh, the Fruiting bodies appear on trees about a year in the year following their uh, the attack by insects. And the insects might be bark beetles or wood borers um, that um, carry this fungus. But this is these kinds of scenes. These are the kinds of scenes we've been seeing around the Willamette Valley. Um, in 2016 and 17, we saw a lot of outright mortality in the valley bottom, um, particularly in stands like this. Um, that are very exposed, uh, planted Douglas fir um, right down on the valley valley floor, and a lot of those trees really checked out. Um, <clears throat> this is some of the other plantings where you start seeing a lot of branch dieback, die uh, um, top dieback, uh, possibly not whole tree mortality, but but basically sort of dying tree parts dying, um, some whole tree mortality. Um, on valley on valley uh, meadow margins uh, and those kind of things, we often see, see you know, younger trees dying, uh, older trees dying, mid trees dying. Uh, it didn't seem to be the age class. A lot of times we'll see an annual canker on these branches where you get this branch flagging. 
Uh, branch flagging is where an individual branch turns red when it dies and it sticks out like a flag, so that branch flagging. And we often associate that kind of more uh, branch death with um, uh, branch cankers in the Douglas fir that we've been seeing all through the Willamette Valley and down along the I-5 corridor. Um, another thing we noticed a lot on some of these Doug on the Douglas fir is what we call a stress cone crop. And um, a stress cone crop is where you get these tiny cones. The cones might be half size or smaller. The seeds may or may not be really any, um, but um, the trees form these, these, what we call these stress crops. And that means the tree took several years to die. And uh, that's another thing that's really consistent with this mortality that we've been seeing is sometimes there's always this growth decline prior to, or not always, but oftentimes there is a growth decline prior to the mortality event. And uh, oftentimes this is associated with what we call these stress cone crops. Um, now, if we look closely at the bowl of the trees, on some of these trees, not all, but on some of these trees, the grass on the outside, meaning that it's been attacked by a bark beetle, in this case, the Douglas fir beetle. And, um, you know, I chopped in through the bark where that uh, frass was, and I found these two Douglas fir beetles here that were started to form a gallery right in this area here. And these are the two beetles, probably a male, a male and a female insect. Um, and they're associated with uh, a lot of uh, tree mortality also. Um, but as we found, not everywhere. Um, and again, the Douglas fir beetle is often associated with clump mortality, where you won't just get one individual tree, you tend to get three to five or eight trees that'll die in a clump. And that's often associated with Douglas fir beetle. However, there's another player that's really showed up in the Douglas fir, and um, that player's the, the, um, uh, the um, Douglas fir borer or the flathead, excuse me, the flathead fur borer. And the flathead fur borer um, has, this is a Douglas fir tree, this picture on the right here. Um, you'll notice on the ground, all this bark flaking. And so this was attacked by the uh, flathead fur borer. The, the beetle larva, this on the left here is the galleries of the flathead fur borer, which are very distinctive from bark beetles. But you'll notice it's this packed frass as these crescent shaped packing. And that's often really indicative of the uh, flat headed fur borer. And these insects will go up into the bark a little bit. Um, and that's where the woodpeckers are going after them. So the, app, the uh, woodpeckers are peeling the bark here, looking for the larva and the grubs, uh, the, the uh, pupa possibly of the flat headed fur borer. And this is a picture from um, the college forest here in the Willamette Valley. So this was something we were associating with Southern Oregon, but we've seen it emerge in the Willamette Valley also. And uh, here's another picture of the flat-headed fur borer. These are the larvae here. You notice this is very classic larvae with this flattened head. And these are the galleries. And this is... Uh, the pattern that you might see if you peel the bark off a tree um, that's declining and the beetles are still there. Uh, so that's the, the Douglas fir beetle and the flat-headed fir borer have been associated with a lot of this mortality. However, um, so those are some of the things that we've been seeing around the valley. And um, the interesting thing is there's been no one consistent thing that seems to be associated with every dead tree. Now we see a lot of the, the flat-headed fur borer has really emerged uh, in, in this recent mortality, this recent mortality we're seeing over the last decade, but it's not in every tree. And we do get trees at higher elevations or in other areas with, um, with other bark beetles, um, including you know, the uh, Douglas fir pole beetle and Douglas fir twig beetles. Uh, we also, um, are, are seeing mortality where we can't find an insect or a bark beetle on the tree at all. We'll fell the tree, debark it, and won't find any, in, any insects. So what we think is really driving this whole thing is drought and heat. 
and those in combination with insects and other pathogens. And so it's really kind of uh, what we describe as a complex interaction of biotic and abiotic factors uh, being driven really by these drought and heat events that we're seeing. However, there has been, particularly in Southern Oregon and in the Willamette Valley margins in the oak where the oak predominates, a uh, fire suppression has really played a role in um, sort of in uh, allowing Douglas fir to move into habitats where it might be marginal. And um, in addition to that, it's allowed Douglas fir to really intensify its uh, density. So we're seeing increases in density of Douglas fir in these habitats and we're in these marginal habitats. And that can contribute to the drought stress when you get drought and heat events. So many of these, um, many of this, much of this mortality we're seeing we always find Oregon white oak nearby. And that may be indicating a side effect and the fact that at the lower elevations and such. So trees on the edge of their noble range of tolerance like Douglas fir in the oak zone is one of the, and when you apply drought to that system, then the Douglas fir trees become extremely vulnerable. Uh, here on the right is our uh, forest map from Oregon Department of Forestry which um, shows the, the vegetation types of uh, Western Oregon. Along the coast here, we have um, uh, the, the blue is the Sitka Spruce Western Hemlock Zone where Douglas fir plays a role, but is planted heavily. There, we're not really seeing a lot of mortality. I mean, there are mortality events along the coast and we do see drought along the coast. But, but um, we're seeing most of the mortality. So the green here is our Douglas fir region. The pink down here is the Klamath Siskiyou. The golden is where we get hardwoods predominating, mostly uh, Oregon white oak. And then the purple here along the margin of the crest is the higher elevation uh, um, Pacific silver fir, mountain hemlock, and those kind of trees. So, and then Eastern Oregon over here. So we're, I'm mostly referring to Western Oregon throughout this talk. Um, so where you get these valleys, as golden is where Douglas fir has moved into this into these oak zones, is where we're seeing a lot of the mortality. So we're seeing mortality along here, along the the um, toe slopes of the Cascades, along the eastern slopes of the, uh, particularly the lower elevations of the Oregon Coast Range throughout the Willamette Valley bottom, around the Eugene area and such, and then down in the inland valleys around Roseburg and Medford and those areas where we see a lot of Douglas fir mortality, particularly down in this area, and again, associated with these lower elevations. Um, So the insects and pathogens that we see associated with Douglas fir mortality, there's a lot of insects and pathogens out there, but right now, the ones we're seeing associated with Douglas fir mortality are the flat-headed fir borer that I mentioned, and the Douglas fir beetle, and some of the other bark beetles, such as Doug fir pole beetle and Doug fir engraver. On the pathogen side, we're not seeing a huge amount of general pathogens. We are seeing a lot of canker diseases associated with Douglas fir, and that's really consistent with stress and drought stress really driving canker diseases abundance. So we, we usually see increases in canker diseases uh, on Douglas fir um, associated with drought stress. So that's very consistent with what we knew. There are a lot of existing root diseases out there, and a lot of this mortality can be associated with root diseases because root diseases, uh, you know, are what we might consider a predisposing condition. And many Douglas fir that are infected by, you know, or have uh, root diseases on part of their root systems are going to be really compromised when you get a severe drought. So root diseases can play a strong role in tree mortality associated with drought also. Um, so here's the set of slides that kind of gets at our drought. Now, this is December, and normally in December, we're out of the drought and it's raining, right? And um, for the last three years, uh, that has not been the case. So this is uh, December 2020 here, and these are the Oregon drought monitor. So um, 
These are the color codes here. Basically, the, the darker reds are more severe drought and the golden and the yellows are less severe drought and white is no drought. But here we go in December 2020, almost the entire state was in drought. We had a really bad drought here in this in the area and even in the Willamette Valley in December. Come December of 2021, we're seeing the same kind of thing, pretty severe drought in all of Western Oregon, except up here in the corner, but east side really getting hammered. And then in December 22, we're back to this, you know, we're still in the same area, you know, it's basically the west side is dry. Now, we're thinking that these droughts are important, but the key factor that seems to be really driving the mortality is our increased temperature and increased drought. So it's the, or excuse me, increased temperature and heat. The, that seems to be uh, one of the big drivers that's a little different than the droughts we had in the, you know, previously. And so we've been seeing more mortality uh, and we're associating it with this heat effect. Now, this is a picture from the Forest Health Highlights in, from their 2022. And this is Western Oregon. And this is color codes for some of the various things that are going on. For example, all this purple right here or blue is the Swiss needle cast. And Swiss needle cast is not necessarily a tree killer, but it, it causes uh, reductions in foliage retention. So the trees don't have as much foliage. They lose a lot of foliage and then they uh, can be show a lot of reduced growth. So this is not tree mortality here. This is uh, visible symptoms of Swiss needle cast along the coast. Um, now, most of the mortality we're seeing is here in this, in the southern foothills of the Cascades and then through the dry valleys and into the uh, Klamath Siskiyou country. And over there, we're seeing several different things. The blue is the fur, the true fur mortality. Uh, and this green here is the Douglas fir mortality. So this is mortality associated with flat-headed fur borer and the Douglas fir beetle in this area here. And that's where we're seeing a lot of that damage in Douglas fir is up into the valley and down here in the Klamath Siskiyous. And this other mortality we're seeing, uh, you heard discussed last week at the... Um, and people are calling Firmageddon. And over here, this is where we're seeing a lot of true fur um, being damaged uh, or killed outright associated with drought. And in that case, the fur engraver, uh, the bark beetle. Now, just uh, going back to talk strictly about Douglas fur, this is a figure from Danny DePente from the Cooperative Era Detection Survey. And this is Syracuse with Douglas fir mortality in Oregon and in Washington. So the golden is Washington here and the blue is Oregon. And you notice Oregon's been clipping along. We've been seeing some mortality, but nothing really outrageous or even comparing to Washington until recently. And in 2022, our mortality numbers went up to almost uh, 450,000 acres which is scattered throughout the state, but concentrated down in the South. And so that was a big uptick for us and is an indication of how much Douglas fir mortality we're seeing associated with these uh, complex factors that we've been talking about. Here's the map that Danny provided, Danny DePinte, the Aerial Detection Survey Coordinator for Oregon and Washington. And this is the Douglas fir, the spatial distribution of just Douglas fir mortality in Oregon. And the color codes are associated with severity. So these pictures, these areas down here are where it's most severe. Here it's scattered throughout the Blue Mountains uh, and the Wallawas and up in the Northern Cascades of Oregon, but it's really concentrated on the West side. And it's concentrated in this Klamath Siskiyou country, particularly at lower elevations. So that's really where we're seeing this Douglas fir mortality, and it's most severe in Southwest Oregon. Um, now, if we look at Southwest Oregon, this is another interpretation of the uh, drought monitor. And this is basically the, this is on the left axis here, this is from 0% to 100% of the area of Jackson County. And then these different color codes represent how much of the area was in various drought. So yellow being abnormally dry uh, through severe drought to exceptional drought. And you can see 
here, 100% of the county was in um, uh, extreme drought. Now we had some good years there, but then in 14, we had some pretty severe years of drought. Then again, in 19, we had drought. And so basically since, since 2019, we've been in some pretty extreme drought in that area. But again, it's not just the drought, it's the added heat that really seems to be um, upticking this uh, mortality because um, the we've seen drought like this before in the past and haven't seen this amount of mortality. And so we're associating a lot of this new mortality with heat. Now, um, Max Bennett and some colleagues have really been working on this for, for a number of years now. And Max has done some, some has pulled a lot of this together. So now I'm gonna sort of put our focus down there to Southwest Oregon, where the, in the, particularly in the Applegate country and the lower valleys, where we've been seeing a lot of Douglas fir mortality. And here you can see these three pictures from Max. Um, Douglas fir mortality here, and down on these slopes here and on these slopes here. So it's really um, in your face kind of mortality down there. And we've been seeing a lot of it. And again, we're so, so Max has done, uh, we've associated a lot of the mortality down there, uh, actually the majority of it with this flat-headed fir borer. And we're not seeing very much Douglas fir beetle down in the Southwest, which was, kind of unusual for us. And so this flathead of fur borer seems to be playing a more important role than we anticipated because we think of it as a secondary mortality agent, something that piles on stress trees and kills them, which is probably what it's doing. But it's we're finding it in more and more trees and it's um, becoming a real concern for us about what role really this beetle has been playing. But you can see this kind of mortality is very common throughout the southern part of uh, Oregon here where you get patches along the edges. Along the edges here, you get mortality among the, the oak forest and then on exposed steep slopes. Um, you also get mortality, but you notice the core parts of the forest area, you don't seem to see the same amount of mortality, which tends to indicate that there may be some kind of stress associated with site conditions um, in addition to what's going on. So uh, Max and his colleagues uh, recently published a nice paper in Journal of Forestry, uh, recent Douglas fir mortality in the Klamath Mountains ecoregion of Oregon evidence for a decline spiral. And this study really focused on causes of mortality and is concluding that, and here's a map of the distribution of the mortality that um, Max and his colleagues focused on uh, here in the Southern, um, Southern Southwest Oregon in the Klamath region. Uh, drought, fire suppression, hot dry sites at lower elevations and flat-headed fur borer altogether seem to be what's associated with this mortality. And we're seeing this as really Douglas fir at the margins of its ability to you know, survive in terms of the amount of precipitation stuff is where we're really seeing a lot of this mortality. Um, this is a pretty complicated figure that I'd like to talk about a little, a little bit here. So we'll, we'll be landing here for a minute, but it's very important. And I think it really gets at um, what's happening with Douglas fir in the Klamath region. And this is also, I think, applicable to the lower elevations of the Willamette Valley and um, uh, also. Um, so there's a couple of things here. So this is annual precipitation here, uh, climate water deficit. I'll explain these maximum summer vapor pressure deficit. And then this is cumulative trees killed. And I'll go through each one of these. But before I do, I want to just point out a few things. So the, on the left axis, you'll see precipitation or VPD or climate water deficit. And it goes from zero to higher numbers in all cases. Then the color codes are for the amount of mortality that's seen. So, for example, this blue here, right here, where um, the precipitation is higher, we're not seeing. This is zero trees killed per kilometer squared. So this is the number of trees killed within a square kilometer, which is a thousand meters on a side, um, which is um, uh, 
much smaller than a than square mile. Um, so, but anyway, uh, the, so this, it, and this code goes from zero trees killed to zero to two trees killed per kilometer squared here, uh, two to 20 trees killed per kilometer squared here, 20 to 100 trees per kilometer squared here, 100 to 500 trees killed per kilometer squared here, and then greater than 500 trees per acre per trees killed per square kilometer here. So as you can see, there's a strong pattern here where we're getting no trees killed at higher precipitation. And um, so uh, a thousand millimeters of precip is about 40 inches. So 2000 here is about 80 inches. So um, this is uh, about, um, let's see, this would be uh, 40, 80, 120 uh, inches, I think there. So this is, um, you know, much higher. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, no, this is, uh, excuse me, this is 60 inches. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I can add, I swear. Uh, anyway, um, this is, you can see that the mortality is not occurring in the wetter sites. It's strongly related to the driest sites where the precipitation is lowest you know, under 40 inches. And basically trees don't do well under 30 inches and 25 inches is really too low for Douglas fir really, unless it's in a really appropriate microsite. So precipitation is a strong driver here, but so is this and uh, climate water deficit. And so here's a definition of climate water deficit. It's really integrated moisture stress measure. And it's the difference between the actual evapotranspiration or the amount of water emerging from vegetation versus the potential evapotranspiration, which is the amount that should come you know, from the vegetation if it wasn't shut down because of drought. So when drought hits, this, the, tr the plants close their stomates and they don't allow water to evaporate from the plant because it's trying to hold on to its water. So therefore, uh, one way to sort of look at this is that the trees aren't releasing water. And so they're really, um, you know, they're really stressed. And so um, climate water deficit shows sort of similar pattern, but sort of the lower the climate water deficit, the less trees killed, the higher the climate water deficit, the more trees killed. So you've got this precipitation effect, then you have this climate water deficit effect, and it's based on this uh, water storage in soils and snow and solar radiation. Then you get, then over here we have vapor pressure deficit. Now, vapor pressure deficit is something that we see is really emerging as an important factor associated with heat. Because um, but so vapor pressure deficit is the difference between the amount of water in the air and the amount of water the air could hold. So the amount of water the air could hold, you know, at 100% humidity. And so um, the vapor pressure deficit shows, you know, basically the drying power of the air. So when you get really, really high vapor pressure deficit, the, 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 the air is really drying everything and you can, and it's pulling water from plants. And so vapor pressure deficit is really important. The key element here is the warmer the air, the more water it can hold. So, um, at a high, at high temperatures, you get higher vapor pressure deficit because the, the for the given the same amount of water in the air, the air will be drier. Um, so the temperature plays a key role here, and vapor pressure deficit it turns out is really important also. So here at the low, at lower vapor pressure deficits, we're getting no trees killed per kilometer square, but at these high vapor pressure deficits, we're getting, we're getting, uh, you know, hundreds of trees killed per, kilo, per kilometer squared. So this is where the heat aspect appears to be really playing an important role because the, you know, the, the heat added on top of a normal drought, if you increase the heat, the drought stress will be much greater and the, tree will, the trees will be suffering and may suffer embolism or excuse me, where the water columns break and you get the and you get top dieback and branch dieback and these kind of things. So the vapor pressure deficit, annual precipitation, climate water deficit, they're all correlated 
with the mortality that we're seeing. And so we think that the, the mortality is actually um, associated with both these climatic factors, this increase in temperature seems to be one of the big drivers of um, this you know, increase in, in climate water deficit and vapor pressure deficit. And so then these, uh, these insects then that are killing these trees are taking advantage of these trees that are under this really severe stress, particularly associated with um, pressure. And then over here in this particular, this is the percent of the total area, and this is numbers of trees killed per kilometer squared. And um, the cumulative trees killed by flat-headed fir borer has really you know, really um, increases when you get more trees, um, when you get, you know, or the, excuse me, the flat-headed fir borer is associated with these areas where you're getting, you know, large, large uh, numbers of trees killed. Um, hopefully I explained that okay. So this figure I think is very important. Um, this is another figure that Max uh, Bennett put together. And again, here's vapor pressure deficit on this. And then these are months of the year. And then he did this for these uh, five years from 2013 through 18. This red line here is the normal line where what we think you know would be normal in the area. And then um, you can see this area here over these years, the vapor pressure deficit is much, much greater than it has been normally in these months of, you know, particularly July and August are really driving a lot of this. So vapor pressure deficit in late spring and summer may explain a lot of this mortality, uh, but we're seeing it in combination with all these other factors, including, you know, the effect of fire suppression on the number of trees and that on the density of trees, uh, particularly in this in the southwest Oregon in the Klamath region, where fire suppression has really changed for structure in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, we pulled together, or Max really led this effort and pulled together this idea of a decline spiral. And this decline spiral has uh, come up. the The person who came up with this was a guy named Paul Mannion, who's a, a forest health. Uh, person, a plant pathologist in uh, um, in New England, but he sort of brought this idea together that the trees die, you know, when they get into this decline spiral that they can't pull out of, and he suggests that there's three sort of sets of factors which associate a tree with mortality. One is predisposing factors, and these are predisposing factors here, such as you know the environment, genetic potential is the soil fertility, soil compaction, um, whether it's an offsite planting, is the tree really adapted for that area? Is there, you know, salt in the soil or some other, you know, is it a gravelly, droughty site, really sandy that isn't holding water very well? That can be a predisposing factor that predisposes the tree to mortality if it suffers a drought. Then there's things he calls inciting factors, and these are things that, you know, okay, you've got this predisposing factor, and then something happens. A drought happens, um, a tree gets defoliated by an insect, you know, something like that, and then that inciting factor really pushes the tree over and puts it into this decline spiral, and then you get these contributing factors, and this is where the biota really pulls in. The, the biota that we're talking about are in this particular idea and scenario are the inciting or excuse me, the contributing factors and predisposing factors and inciting factors are driving things, but it's the biota that then come in and kill the tree in the end. And so that's what we think is going on. And here is uh, how we um, Max and his colleagues organized this. In the predisposing factors, you know, water stress sites, high heat load, low precipitation, limited soil water availability, high climate water deficit, you know, landscape change, uh, Douglas fir encroachment into these pine oak sites, Douglas fir densification, you know, it's it's much much denser. The entire forest is much denser than it was, and then you get increased abundance of Douglas fir on marginal sites. The inciting factors then are what we're calling hot drought or hotter drought. 
And that's where you get this, you have a precipitation drought, but you're getting higher temperatures and therefore higher vapor pressure deficit. And that impairs physiological functioning of drought stress Douglas fir trees, resulting in reduced resistance you know, to these stressors. And then you have the contributing factors like the biotic agents that we've been talking about. Flat-headed, in our case down south, there was no Douglas fir beetle in any of the trees we felled and looked at. And we found flat-headed fir borer was the primary insect. And then we also have other secondary beetles that we found and then canker diseases. And these things, all three of these things together, put this tree, put these trees into what we call this decline spiral. And this may take several years for the tree to die. So that's where those stress crop come in, stress cone crops and those kind of things that we see. Um, we see, you know, declining in growth for a number of years before mortality. And that plays into this whole decline spiral idea. And you get tree death at the end of this decline spiral, unless it starts raining again and some of the trees can pull out of it. Um, so this is kind of where we're at with what, what's happening in the Klamath country in particular. And we think this is very consistent with what's, with what's going on at the lower elevations um, in the Willamette Valley. Um, now, another thing that we have here uh, is, um, this is, uh, let's see if I did this right. Yeah, there we go. So here's Grants Pass. Um, this is Medford over here. So um, just to get you oriented. And this is the climate water deficit from 1980 to 2010. And these red areas are where we saw a lot of our mortality currently is in these areas where you can really see their and the green areas where we're not seeing much mortality. This is, uh, then we've projected this, or Max ran this through these projections, and this is the projected climate water deficit for 2055, so in another, you know, 30 years or so, and you can see how much more extreme this is. So one of the, you know, depending on how this plays out over the next 30 or 40 years, we could really see an intensification of Douglas fir mortality in this area with this increasing climate water deficit uh, associated with drought and, and higher VPD. Um, but this is a prediction, not the actual thing. So this is something that we're just concerned about now. And part of what uh, um, Max and his colleagues did with this paper is create a, uh, a method, if you go to this paper to read, to sort of see how you might predict where Doug's fur would be most vulnerable, and then how you might, you know, manage around that. Okay, so that's, um, we're hoping that, you know, Mother Nature saves us and um, it starts to rain again more consistently. We had a really good winter. They had a good winter down in the Medford area also. A lot of, uh, and so now we're just hoping that, you know, come this winter, the rains will start up again in October rather than, you know, December or January as they have been. Um, and, but we're associating much of the Douglas fir mortality with this, with these phenomena on the West side. Um, okay, well now to switch gears really quickly, I can't talk about West side Douglas fir without talking about Swiss needle cast. And this is a foliage disease of Douglas fir. In this particular picture out near Tillamook along the coast, you can see this Douglas fir here is this yellow crowns here. And that's really classic uh, Swiss needle cast symptoms. The green here is red alder and the, uh, the light green here is red alder, red alder here through this matrix. And then these dark green trees are hemlock and spruce, which this are not susceptible. To Dave, disease. your slide didn't advance for some reason. Or... Oh, it didn't? There it is. Uh, Maybe just delayed. Okay. Yeah. Is and this... you're, you're about 40 minutes in, just FYI. Okay, I'll zip through these. Anyway, so okay. sorry about that. Uh, so here's the uh, Swiss needle cast uh, distribution map from 2022. Um, at the same time we're having this drought, this is associated with warmer winter temperature and, and summer leaf wetness. And here we are on the coast. We had our biggest year ever. For, we've been sampling since uh, 1996. And um, this was our largest year ever at over 600,000 acres 
um, with visible symptoms. So something very different is going on along the coast. This is another picture of some of those symptoms. Here's the map, here's 1996 here, here's 2022 with our highest numbers yet. During the drought, it dropped down a little and then it really kicked up. Um, and then the other thing, this is a this is miles from the coast over here, and this is the year, and this is the percentile of the total amount of pixels. So we took that map, pixelized it, and basically said, ask this question, is the Swiss needle cast epidemic moving east from the coast? And the answer is no. And over the last 20 years, it's virtually been stable. And this is the 99% of all the pixels with Swiss needle cast were within 25 miles of the coast. And then if you look at um, this here, is this is the 75th percentile. So 75% of all the visible symptoms that we saw were within 15 miles of the coast. And they've stayed that way for the last 20 years. So that is a very, that is indicating a very much a environmental driver to the Swiss needle cast epidemic. Um, we do have a new plot network. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that foliage retention in years really drives growth losses. Um, and then these are just some maps that we've been able to create with our new plot network. And you can see needle retention is lowest near the coast there. And not the uh, just wanted to mention, we do have a new publication out on managing Swiss needle cast, and that's available through the OSU extension. Okay, uh, all of this information is available in these forest health highlights that comes out annually, um, and Oregon Department of Forestry, U.S. Forest Service collaborate with others to create this really nice resource, the forest health highlights, and you can find a lot of this information there, and um, these are posted online, and here's a link to that. So with that, um, I'll draw to an end, and hopefully we do have some time for questions and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we have a good amount of time for questions. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I'll stop sharing. How's that? Is that all right to stop sharing? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Yeah, of course depending on whether somebody asks you to go back and look at something. Uh, oh, but, okay. but don't worry about that. We'll just see how things go. I do not okay. see any questions in the chat. Um, you just made it really clear that a hot drought is really a, a big trigger, but here, here's one now. So we'll uh, take a look at the question in the chat. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and... and uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Douglas uh, Fur, so, I'll just read it out loud for everybody. Okay. Um, Doug Fur originally encroached on historically oak habitat due to climate shift uh, towards a wetter climate and maintained by cultural burning of Native American tribes. Uh, in this oak habitat type, do you think Doug Fur mortality could be seen as corrective process? <laughs> well, as it turns out, you're exactly right. A number of people have been saying that, um, that this, this is a sort of correction in that that fire suppression the the taking away native american burning and this and we went through some wetter periods so that um you know seeds were able to germinate and get established much better and now we're suffering from drought so there is a lot there are a lot of folks that are saying this is a, a you know initially what we're seeing is corrective the fear is if we continue down this road of climate change and hotter drought and increasing temperatures that it'll, it'll eventually start moving up into the core areas of Douglas fir. But at this time, I think you're correct. This is the area where Douglas fir really has changed uh, a, a, its abundance and you know density and its occurrence associated with these um, other factors such as fire suppression and um, you know, going through some wetter climates uh, um, scenarios over certain decades. So that's absolutely right. Um, another question. In, uh, what oh, caused? the one in. Oh, go. Ahead. Well, we just wanted to say it out loud for folks. Uh, what caused the okay. die-off spike in Washington in two thousand eight? 
that I'm not sure of. Um, I've typically associated that with drought, but I can't say that. As a matter of fact, I would have to do some digging and go back in and look at that. Um, but I don't know what the actual um, purpose was. It possible there was a Douglas fir beetle outbreak um, because they uh, had a lot of that in northern uh, Washington, uh, particularly in the north northeast Washington. So it's possible uh, that was a lot of that might have been driven by east side uh, mortality of Douglas fir associated with the bark beetle outbreak. But I'm not 100% sure, so I should be careful. Uh, another question came in about, uh, do you recommend pheromone traps to control beetle kill on private lands? So the pheromone trap, the only uh, pheromone, effective pheromone trap uh, or pheromone that we have is um, the, for the Douglas fir beetle. And we don't, the, we have no pheromone trap or pheromone products that could help with the flat-headed fur borer. So we do um, recommend uh, Douglas fir. Um, if, if you do have Douglas fir and you do have Douglas fir beetle around the pheromone, uh, we do have an anti-aggregation pheromone that is pretty effective. So it's not really a trap, it's a disperser and you can protect individual trees and individual stands of trees with these pheromones from Douglas fir beetle. Typically, we tend to associate the, the, the Douglas fir beetle outbreaks with wind throw. And, um, but in cases of drought, it can be effective. But what we've been seeing with the flat-headed fir borer, you know, we, we don't have any pheromones that are effective with the flat-headed fir borer. So this would only be, it would only be effective as a treatment to prevent mortality caused by Douglas fir beetle. Um, and in very restricted situations, you know, individual stands or individual trees. Uh, I hope that answered that question okay. Yep. Um, and then another question. Um, are land managers still planting Doug fir right next to the coast? Uh, if so, why? And are there better alternatives? So it depends on the landowner. Many landowners see Douglas fir as their, you know, the golden tree, and it's worth really a lot of money. They know all the genetics. And so there are people that are continuing to plant it on the coast. On the other hand, there's a significant amount of landowners who are not. And they've been moving towards uh, Western Hemlock primarily, um, where they think they can get it established, you know, uh, without vertebrate damage, you know, Western Red Cedar is another option. And uh, Sicca spruce in some cases, but that's not really considered an option because of the Sicca spruce weevil, which prevents um, trees from really developing well in plantations of Sicca spruce. So right now it's really Western hemlock uh, is the primary replacement because it goes so well along the coast and Sicca spruce, uh, excuse me, and Western red cedar uh, is another alternative, but it's not used as much western hemlock really seems to be the the tree on the south coast there's a lot of buzz about uh coastal redwood being potentially a replacement for douglas fir in the swiss needle cast areas and they're starting to do a lot of work with redwood along that particularly the south coast we're not really promoting it on the north coast or anything yet but the on the south coast many of the landowners are moving in that direction to to try redwood because of its value um, and it apparently is not as susceptible to deer browse as western red cedar i don't know if anybody can correct me there or not but i've heard that uh, repeated but uh yeah so i hope that answers but but to tell you the truth most of the landowners i know are really focusing on western hemlock along the coast it's a fast grower there is a market for it. It's not quite as valuable as Douglas fir, but it it can it grows well and it can meet most of the needs. Um, but it's just not as valuable as Douglas fir. So a lot of people like they just like Douglas fir for that reason. Um, any other questions or? Um, don't see any popping up in the chat uh, just now. Um, I guess. Uh, make some comments because you know you showed us a lot about the uh 
the flathead fur borer and its effects on Douglas fir in Southwest Oregon. And then you did mention that, you know, we're think we're seeing similar things uh, happening in the, the Willamette Valley. Um, and you talked about the, you know, the way that Douglas fir is kind of maybe encroached on sites that are more marginal. Um, and I guess the other factor that's important is so many of these lands are managed or in the kind of farm forest zone where, you know, people have been planting Doug fir as the primary uh, choice and so in addition to the natural encroachment you know there's been been a lot of planting so um, does it seem like there's some of those areas where there's maybe back to that corrective <laughs> uh, factor or, or you know where we've if in doubt plant Douglas fir over the last 50 years then maybe we're finding out some places where it's not as well adapted in some of these marginal sites. Right um, I will say that on on industrial the forest lands um, you know, we aren't seeing, and I think it may be because they're at higher elevations and on more productive sites, they they tend not to be in the oak zone and that kind of thing. We're not seeing a lot of Douglas fir mortality associated with the forestry, production forestry that we see in Western Oregon, um, unless they're really, you know, down at the lower elevations or, or you know, we're planted on, on oak sites. Um, but in general, we aren't hearing a lot from industry that they're losing a lot of trees. So, so far, um, even though we're seeing a lot of this mortality, it's been on probably more, more often, it seems to be on the small woodland owner properties where we're seeing this mortality. <clears throat> and it's very, very difficult to deal with. As everyone knows, you know, if you get 50 dead dug firs on your property, you know, if, it's very expensive to take them out. There doesn't seem to be a firewood market it's it's very difficult to manage this mortality on on our small woodland owners um i mean i have five acres and i lost probably 50 trees and the willamette valley margin here and um i'm i'm struggling to deal with it <laughs> i still have a lot of standing dead trees I, yeah you know, not quite um, enough for a timber sale or they're not in a quality no um, there's no, yeah so. i see that nancy has her hand up uh nancy do you want to if you want to unmute yourself, you can just ask your question out loud. Thank you. Uh, the text, the um, chat on my phone's a little challenging. Sure. Um, so I have um, 20 acres between the pudding and the Malala. So talk about Willamette um, Valley bottom. I think that's me. Mm -hmm. um, and I have my, I have a few, not more than 20, um, dug fir trees that still look like they're in pretty good shape. My western red cedars are dying, um, and I've you know been hearing drought for um, the last three sessions. And I actually don't have, uh, but maybe a single six-inch tall oak tree. But my my understanding of the area is that I should be covered in oak more than than fir and I'm wondering because I'm looking at planting to bring um, shade and wind block um, onto the property it's been stripped for um, farming whether I would be um, best to look into uh, white um, oak and trying to cultivate that and I have a lot of um, uh, Doug for volunteers um, but concerned about cultivating those further um, and whether I would be better off holding the, um, the water and the space and planting oaks, if you have thoughts on that. Well, um, yeah, and I, I actually, I think Glenn also probably has a lot of really good thoughts on that. So um, I'll just say, um, I, I, you know, a lot of what we're thinking is basic common, you know, is common sense stuff, which it sounds like you've been doing the the you know so potentially reducing density uh of douglas fir or what we also see is a lot of microsite variation um so if you're if you're sort of aware of your wetter sites versus your drier sites within your 20 acres you might sort of you know lower density of douglas fir on your drier sites uh, more pushing more towards oak and then in your and if you have you know sort of more mesic sites or or wetter or, or sites you you might be able to get away with Douglas fir there 
Um, but it can be really tricky, depends on what's happening. Um, I think I might actually pass this over to you, Glenn, uh, since that's your area and you've been seeing a lot of this there. Um, what kind yeah. of recommendations? Well, so, so much of it comes down to knowing your land and your soils. And of course, you mentioned, you know, being in the valley uh, between the pudding and Molala. Um, one of the other issues there is a lot of those soils are too wet uh, in the winter. And um, so then we have too wet for Douglas fir in the winter and then too dry in the summer. Uh, and the valley, the Oregon white oak and also the Willamette Valley Ponderosa pine are both pretty well adapted to those valley sites, especially if they're a little wet in the winter and then drier in the, and warmer in the summer. So definitely Oregon white oak is something to consider. Uh, the you know the knowledge and the practices for establishing it um there's a lot of folks working on that and definitely you know you should contact uh, me and also the soil and water conservation district um and also uh the metro organization is doing a lot of oak management so there's a lot to be learned from people that are trying to uh, bring oak back in some of these areas um as far as you know how to establish it how to manage it um oak grows very slowly at first and also, you know, it used to be maintained by fire, so it, it's not really aggressive and dominating the way Douglas fir is as far as taking over a site once it's established. So there's a challenge as to how do you maintain that sort of more open condition and keep the oak from being overwhelmed by brush or, um, or even the grass that it, that it has to compete with uh, when there's not the, you know, the burning that used to help maintain oak meadows and oak woodlands. Uh, but anyway, I, yeah, it is certainly something worth considering along with that uh, Valley Ponderosa Pine is a native adapted to that. Yeah, and you might thank you. Your, yeah, you might keep your options open and not maybe go in with all in on one thing and keep, you know, maybe, you know, try some diversity, you know, keep keep some diversity on the site, you know, yeah. like maybe a little yeah. Doug Fir, little, little, you know, Ponderosa Pine, you know, some oak. That kind of thing, uh, you know, that's not really a, a timber approach, but uh, there still may be some timber output from that. But um, yeah, just getting native trees to survive and have a viable forest system going forward or woodland system. There's a question in the chat. Um, at what elevation does Douglas fir prefer? Ah, well, that we we associate increasing precipitation with increasing elevation and so um in the southern part of the state douglas fir really seems to be doing better above three thousand feet um i'd say up here uh glenn i don't know if you want to check me on this but two thousand feet is probably 1500 to 2000 feet is probably okay for douglas fir are you well I... well the thing it, it's in the willamette valley you know we we go as low as 200 feet and there are healthy native old douglas fir you know at low elevations and of course it, out on the coast it grows down to sea level um so it then becomes more of a soils and a microsite issue as well as um, not just elevation but precipitation um so that, you know, you mentioned 30 inches is sort of a threshold. You know, most of the Willamette Valley is 30 inches or greater. So an awful lot of it has to do with soils. Um, right. And then, and we may see it moving up in elevation too. Um, so it, it's, a, I, it's a little tricky to say, is there an absolute elevation? Certainly about 2,000 feet, you know, things are a lot cooler and milder and we're not seeing hardly any of these uh, drought and hot drought issues. Um uh, but down below, you know, 1,000 feet, there are still quite viable sites for Douglas fir. Um, and then it has to do more with the topography and the, you know, exposure and the soils. And right, so, so no, probably knowing your land is the key. 30, 35 inches, 35 to 45 inches, you know, precip is is the, the lower threshold. end. And then as you get above 45 to 50 inches, you're into some really good Doug fir ground you know yep. 50 inches 50 55 inches you know like up on mary's peak and stuff it's um yeah so knowing your soils and your precipitation zone well we're at seven o'clock it's uh it's been a very informative session dave thank you 
And of course, I imagine people are maybe <laughs> getting used to the, the heat and the drought uh, <laughs> uh, situation is one of the main triggers of some of our, uh, why are my trees dying? Um, but that, that, that will probably continue. Um, so with that, um, I don't see any more questions. I see people saying thank you. And so I will echo that. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thanks, Sarah, for your help in setting all this up. Um, so the next session is a week from today, and it'll be me talking about alder and broadleaf trees. So great. Well, thank you all for attending. Very good. Thank you. Good night, thank everyone. Thanks for inviting me, uh, Sarah and Glenn. You're welcome, Dave. Glad you could make it. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye.